Much like that bold introduction, we can't help feeling that the Dorna story is a lot of hype. We are presented Oberyn Martell, only to have his head crushed in. We are presented Ariana Martell, only to have her plans foiled. And we are presented Quentin Martell, only to have him roasted. Nearly two years ago, I did a video series called The Dornish Master Plan. It's a bit special in that it really brought viewers to my channel. And I think it appealed to people because it proposed purpose and direction to the Dornish chapters and the Brave Companions. But does it really hold up? The Dornish Master Plan does have some weaknesses. It assumes the Brave Companions could spark a religious movement. Additionally, it doesn't really integrate or explain the Ariana chapters. And finally, it identifies that Oberyn was scheming long before the death of Elia, but it doesn't really explain why. So let's go back, look at everything from a different angle, and try to go deeper. On to the deeper Dorne. Now many people think of Dorne as a unified entity, but there is an important and significant divide. As Tyrion explains, there are stony Dornishmen, sandy Dornishmen, and salty Dornishmen. Salty Dornishmen have the most Rhoynish blood, while stony Dornishmen have the least. This ethnic difference makes the salty Dornish look dark, while the stony Dornish retain the looks of the Andals and the First Men. Of course, the Rhoynish were refugees who came to Dorne a thousand years ago with Queen Nymeria. And with them, they brought Dornish law, law that holds men and women as equals in terms of inheritance. This certainly has irked the more sexist Andal and First Men houses. In fact, Ariana says as much about House Ironwood. And she even fears that her father has yielded to these Andal and First Men ideals. So this Dornish divide is really about the feminist Rhoynish and the sexist Andal First Men. And this divide is actually put right in front of us by our author in the first Dornish chapter. They watched a nut-brown girl yank a tow-headed boy off his brother's shoulders to tumble him headfirst into the pool. That's right, a brown girl bringing down the white patriarchy. Now I'd like to talk about the houses of Dorne and which ones are Doran Martell's greatest allies. Let's start with the eight houses that accompany Oberyn to King's Landing. The first house of the column is House Dalt of Lemonwood. They are followed by House Blackmont of Blackmont, House Manwoody of Kingsgrave, House Corgyle of Sandstone, House Uller of Hellholt, House Illyrian of God's Grace, House Gargolin of Saltshore, and House Jordain of the Tor. Doran later has a banquet for Balon's Swan where three additional houses are invited. House Fowler of Skyreach, House Toland of Ghost Hill, and House Wile of Wile. Now, just because someone is loyal to you doesn't mean you necessarily trust them to water your plants. Competency and the ability to keep secrets are huge factors in who you choose to be part of your team, or at least your inner circle. For example, both House Uller and House Gargolin are described as hot-tempered, reckless houses. They might support House Martell in war, but they might not be the best with scheming. So who are the cool-tempered, loyal, and competent ones? Well, interestingly, during the banquet for Balon Swan, the Seneschal Ricasso proposes a toast for King Tommen. Now, the Dornish are generally no fans of the Lannisters. The Dornish supported the Targaryens during Robert's Rebellion, and the Lannisters killed Elia and her children. Some people, though, show their self-control and their tact and drink to the toast. These people include Ariana Martell, Lady Jordain, Lord Illyrian, Lord Dalt, Lady Toland, and Ilaria Sand. Members of House Gargolin, Fowler, Manwoody, Uller, and Wyle all fail this test, along with Damon Sand. Now, in addition to these houses, it's also very likely that Doran Martell trusts the orphans of the Greenblood. After all, Prince Tristane's sworn shield is an orphan. And there's one more event that reveals what houses are most loyal to Doran. When a feast for crows begins, Doran Martell is at the Water Gardens and says goodbye to his three favorite children, a Dalt, a Blackmont, and an orphan. Of course, using children to spy and pass messages is something that Varys does. And considering Doran Martell doesn't trust his maester, it's likely he has an alternative method for communication. So in red, we have the most trusted houses, those that are part of the communication network. And in pink, we have the more trusted houses, those with self-control. And in blue, we have the houses that would probably support the Martells in war, but can't be trusted with much else. It should be noted that House Vaith of Vaith, House Santigar of Spotswood, House Dane of Starfall, and House Ironwood of Ironwood do not seem to be trusted houses. Now, from a quick look at the map, you can see that Doran's greatest supporters are generally clustered near the Greenblood and the Broken Arm. This is where Nymeria landed, and these houses are the Salty Dornish, the ones with the most Rhoynish blood. There are exceptions, of course, Doran also seems to have strong support from House Blackmont. This may be because the house is headed by a woman and has a female heir. They would be much more disposed to favor Dornish law and the Rhoynish way of life. Now I'd like to talk a bit about Doran, Oberyn, and what it means for them to be Rhoynish. Let's start with Doran Martell. Who is he? Well, Varys calls Doran Martell a sentimental man. Varys tells us that he mourns Elia, 
and we hear Doran talk about Obara and Oberon's childhoods. But what of his own childhood? Well, at a young age, Doran squired at House Gargolin at Salt Shore on the southern coast of Dorne. We hear about the southern coast of Dorne from the Ironborn. It's described as a dry and bleak place. Bleak, coming from Ironborn. This may be why Doran loves the water gardens so much. As a young man, Doran then visited the free cities. He traveled from Volantis to Norvos, where he met his wife. But let's think about that for a second. If he traveled from Volantis to Norvos, that means he would have passed by Croyane, the ancient ruined city of the Roinar. Tyrion, of course, passes Croyane on his trip down the Roin aboard the Shy Maid. Roofless towers appeared and disappeared, thrusting blindly upward. Halls and galleries drifted past. Graceful buttresses, delicate arches, fluted columns, terraces and bowers. All ruined, all desolate, all fallen. The fog concealed three quarters of the palace, but what they glimpsed was more than enough for Tyrion to know that this island fastness had been ten times the size of the Red Keep. Once, and a hundred times more beautiful. He knew where he was. The Palace of Love, he said softly. That was the Roinar name, but for a thousand years, this has been the Palace of Sorrow. The ruin was sad enough, but knowing what it had been made it even sadder. There was laughter here once, Tyrion thought. There were gardens bright with flowers and fountains sparkling golden in the sun. These steps once rang the sound of lovers' footsteps, and beneath that broken dome, marriages beyond count were sealed with a kiss. His thoughts turned to Tysha. If Croyane had such a profound effect on Tyrion, we have to assume that the experience would even be greater for the sentimental Prince of Dorne. After all, Dorne and his family are essentially all that is left of the greatness of the Roinar. And this must have been quite a contrast for Doran. He grew up at Salt Shore knowing the bleakness of Dorne and is faced with the past greatness of the Roinar. On returning to Dorne, Doran must have been a completely different man. Oberyn's childhood started out very similar to Doran's. He was fostered at Sandstone with House Corrigile, again growing up around bleakness. We don't know much else about his childhood, except around age 14 in the year 271, he visited Old Town and impregnated a prostitute. That prostitute would give birth to Obara Sand. It just so happens that Marwyn also frequents brothels in Old Town, so I do wonder if the two met. We know that Doran returned from the Free Cities with his fiancée, around the year 273, somewhat before Tyrion's birth. And the two brothers must have spoken of their adventures. Doran would speak of Croyane, and Oberyn would speak of Old Town. Soon after, Oberyn and Elia were sent on a trip to find them spouses. Among other places, Oberyn once again visited Old Town. Elia was perhaps to marry a Hightower, but Oberyn made fun of the suitor, ruining Elia's opinion of him. The two went on to Casterly Rock, where Tywin turned down an offer to marry Oberyn to Cersei. Very soon after this trip, Oberyn was found a bed with Lord Ironwood's paramour. Oberyn was challenged to a duel by Lord Ironwood that was supposed to be non-lethal, but Lord Ironwood died of his wounds anyway. Oberyn was accused of being a poisoner and was exiled. For the third time, Oberyn made a trip to Old Town and then traveled to Lice. And then Oberyn's life gets almost impossibly busy. He studies poisons for a while before meeting a Volantian noblewoman, likely in Volantis. In around the year 274, he impregnates this woman with Lady Nim. Oberyn also traveled to free cities and would almost certainly pass by the ruined city of Croyane. At some point, Oberyn returned to Old Town and studied at the Citadel. He earned six links of a maester's chain, which means he was likely in Old Town at least two years, as Sorella Sand took one year to get three links, and she's considered a genius go-getter. Now at some point around the year 276, Oberyn met and impregnated a Septa from the Reach. And this Septa gave birth to Tyene Sand, and she trained Tyene in the knowledge of the faith. Oberyn then at some point traveled back to Essos to the Disputed Lands and joined the Second Sons. He soldiered with them for a while before founding his own sellsword company. Sometime around the year 280, he met a Summer Islander ship captain and impregnated her. This may have been on his way back to the Harrenhal tourney, which he attended in 281. And this ship captain would give birth to Sorella Sand. Oberyn's grand adventures and hypermotivation would come to an end with the death of Elia in 283. Oberyn returned to Dorne and seldom left after that. He did threaten to raise Dorne for Viserys in 284 and was involved in Viserys' marriage pact, and we'll talk more about those in a future video. But other than that, we hear little of Oberyn. Oberyn seems to have become more of a family man. He retrieved his four daughters from their mothers and had four more daughters with Ilaria Sand. We know he spent time training his daughters in various abilities, and we know he enjoyed taking his family to Shandystone, a ruined holdfast. And we know he enjoyed telling stories. The stories of Oberyn show that he too was a sentimental man. 
We know that he told stories of Garen the Great, the Roinar prince who stood up to the Valyrians. We know that he named a daughter Nymeria, after the Roinar queen who led the Roinar away from the slaughter of the Valyrians. We know that Oberyn looks fondly on the Dornish rebellion against Daron I. And we know that Oberyn thinks that Dorne was fierce before marrying into the Seven Kingdoms with Daron II. And it would be tempting to look to the past for Oberyn. After all, Dorne is now, relatively speaking, weak. It's the least populous of the Seven Kingdoms. The Dornish are forced to lie about their military strength. And it's a largely bleak environment, which Dorne and Oberyn know intimately. But most importantly, it's dying. As I mentioned earlier, Oberyn likes to visit Shandystone, a place where the wells dried up a hundred years ago. This is a striking harbinger of what may face the rest of Dorne. Wealth in Dorne is measured in water, water that is running out. And our author opens the Queenmaker chapter with this fact. Oberyn feels it necessary to visit Shandystone and educate his daughter Sorella on its history. And that's the primary point here. Dorne and Oberyn's root motivation appears to be more linked to the death of the Roinar than the death of Elia. They claim they want to avenge Elia, and certainly they do, but that can't be the end of it. The visits to Croyain, the admiration and stories of past greatness, the association with houses that are ethnically Roinar or those with Roinish ideals, and most of all, Oberyn's hyper-motivated life prior to the death of Elia. They all point to something even bigger. In a sense, this Dornish master plan is at its heart a Roinish master plan, and we'll talk more about these plans in part two.